I'm Lynn McCormick McDonald. I am Associate Director of Learning Resources at the Gibbs Campus. And before we start, I just wanted to say thank you to Kathy McKay here at your campus. She has put this together through unbelievable amount of work, which you don't see, it's all on the back end. And also uh, for Anjum Perfetti with SGA. Thank you to the SGA and to the provost here at Allstate because without this great partnership, you wouldn't be able to enjoy this wonderful event. So, poetry. Poetry is this parallel universe that exists all around us. And we're so busy every day with our to-do list and our seriousness of, I gotta get this done. I have to study, I have to go to work. I have all these responsibilities. So sometimes we forget about the parallel universe of beauty and emotions and everything beautiful about life. It's easy to just keep going and, and not notice the sunrise and the flower and the butterfly that just passed right in front of your face. So today I wanna invite you to take that breath, take a step back, enjoy that other part of life that makes us human. And you know, we can go back to our busyness after. But for this short period of time, I just want you to kind of realize that you have this other element to our, ourselves, more than the, the walking to-do list. So let me go ahead and I just uh, remind everyone, please turn off your cell phone. And uh, I also want to um, just give a quick introduction to doc Dr. Menke. Uh, there will be a question and answer session at the end of this. So if you have questions, kind of try to keep them in mind for the end. Uh, he'll be available to sign books after. And um, so uh, today's a poem in your pocket day. I want to just point out that in front of you, there are different poems. They're not all the same poem. So take that with you and share. This is your opportunity to enjoy the, the poetry. Uh, we're honored today to have Dr. Menke as our keynote speaker. In 2009, Dr. Menke was appointed the City of St. Petersburg Inaugural Poet Laureate. So he's the first one. In 2015, Governor Rick Scott appointed him Poet Laureate of Florida. He's only the fourth Poet Laureate in the history of our state. What does the Florida Poet Laureate do? <laughs> uh, they promote reading, writing, and the appreciation of poetry throughout the state, and they encourage students to express themselves through poetry and reading out loud. Dr. Mankey is a national award-winning poet and author of more than 20 books. We're so lucky. I, I got his autograph for our book in the library at Gibbs Campus, which will live there in perpetuity. And, uh, but he has written so many different things. He's written his collection of stories, The Piano Tuner, which won the 1986 Flannery O'Connor Award. And um, he's written many, many other books. I, I want to make sure that I have given him a lot of time to spend with you. He's also, uh, he joined Eckerd College in 1966 where he founded and directed his write, the, the writing workshop there. He also um, was the Distinguished Teacher Award there. One, uh, one way of putting his writing into words was uh, one critic said, Peter Menke writes, it is clear under a banner of wisdom. His wit is sly and as dry as a good martini. So on that note, there's so many more things to say about Dr. Menke, but on that note, I will turn it over to Dr. Menke. Enjoy the day, thank you. Thank you, thank you very much, uh, Lynn and Kathy and uh, everybody who uh, put this together and thank all of you for coming. I, my sergeant in the army never asked me to give a reading. I, I probably didn't push it hard enough with him. Uh, and, uh, but I've, I've never eaten in a, in a pizza restaurant before either. And it, I, I like it, uh, I like the smell of it. Uh, um, this is the end of National Poetry Month. Some of you may not have 
even read a poem yet. You just have a couple of days left. And uh, I'm here to help you out a little bit. I, I, we, we don't have a lot of time, but I'll, I'll try to put in five or six poems. Um, and uh, when I uh, became poet laureate a couple of years ago, so I, I was getting interviewed, and, and uh, I got interviewed by the, I guess it must have been the Tampa Bay Times. And um, the next day when the Tampa Bay Times came out, the headlines were, Laureate claims poetry is not broccoli. It seemed like one of the strangest poetry headlines that uh, I've ever seen. And what I have been trying to tell them, uh, can you hear me all right in the back? Is good? Um, what I was trying to tell them was that uh, I didn't like the idea that teachers would make you read poetry because it's good for you. I thought, you know, make it a little work. It should be fun. You should enjoy it. And what I would recommend for all of you to do is, is to take it a little bit at a time, try to find some poems you might like in a library. And that I guarantee for every one of you there are some poetry uh, that, that you do like. But I didn't like to, I wouldn't want to say read it and make yourself a better person. I'm sure you're all fine, fine persons. In fact, one of the things that happened to me, I grew up in the tough section of Brooklyn and Flatbush. That was, I don't know what it is like today. I understand it's getting uh, changed and, and uh, revitalized. But anyway, uh, when I would tell, then I was a kid, a little kid, and I'd like to write poems. And uh, if, when I just happened to mention it, either to my parents, uh, I, I don't know if I've told my teachers, but certainly to my friends, and they always said, what, you're, you're reading what? what been poetry, you know? And so I had the feeling that it was subversive, and this was very attractive. So, you know, that's, I turned to it because nobody, everybody was trying to keep me, you know, from reading poetry. And I said, there must be something there that, and they were right. There's something there that I, I loved right, right from the get, beginning. Um, I think uh, I should try to get in as, as many poems as, as I can. Poets, one of the things that poets do, I think, uh, they are not making really weird things usually that you've never heard of, but they are looking at familiar things that you've all been through, you know, a, a meal, a, a person, a house, a, a park, an ocean, a boat, a joke, uh, this kind of thing, and they look at it with, I guess, with new eyes. Uh, Howard Nemirov, a really wonderful poet, got the Pulitzer Prize. Uh, he said, well, the poets aren't geniuses. He said that they just haven't grown up. And that his poets are like children and that they're always surprised. They, they, they look around, they say, whoa, you know, and I look, well, this is a really strange. And I, I see these creatures behind me. And these, these are when I look more carefully, these, these are the cameras set up. But poets' minds work like that. And they're, uh, and, and a, a typical reaction to poetry is often uh, not like, I didn't know this, actually, like, but more like, I knew that, I just didn't know how to say it. And, and you, you, then you, it makes you look at the world in a new way, the way a child looks. Or, and, and then it goes on to do other things too. But, so I'm going to start with one that I thought that uh, is, is most familiar. We came down from the north in 1966, so that would date this poem a long time ago. And this is my, the first poem I wrote in, in Florida, and I, was, I had been writing poetry, uh, but had not published a book yet, just in, in magazines, and this was one of the first ones, uh, and I wrote it about uh, Disney World, the Magic, the magic Kingdom, because we, we took our kids there, and then uh, it, it got published in the, uh, in the New Republic, a very nice, nice magazine. And it had a, uh, a funny start for the, for the kind of poems that I was gonna write because I'm looking in the wrong book, I think. Uh, but at any rate, um, the next week after it was published, the editor of the uh, New Republic wrote to me and he, and he said, uh, well, you know, we're publishing a letter that really attacks your poem. And it says, you have desecrated the sacred memory of Walt Disney. Oh, 
Well, that, that, that was semi-upsetting and semi-exciting. I felt two ways about this. Uh, but I felt he had looked at the poem uh, pretty carefully because he, he said the sacred memory of Walt Disney. And it's true, one of the things that happened to me when I began writing this, uh, because we actually liked them, you know, the Magic Kingdom of Disney World. We just had a good time. The kids loved it and all of this kind of thing. But it, it, it occurred to me that in other countries, people make their, their, their trips, you know, of devotion and attention to, uh, to Chart or, or to, the, to the, a mosque or to a, a cathedral or to Canterbury. And uh, Americans make their trips to Disney World. And I thought, well, that should be noted in, in, in some kind of way. And he picked up, the, you will hear in this, in this poem, words like relics and uh, uh, I guess pilgrims. We make our pilgrimages not to Canterbury, but uh, but to Disney World. So uh, now, one of the things that poetry does, because I'm, I'm trying to say some general things as well as, as reading you these poems, uh, it's the kind of writing that's closest to music. So this is a free verse poem, but you will hear rhyme scattered through here. There will be kinds of rhythms, but it's it's all in my head, and I'm I'm, I'm trying to make it so that uh, you would like it better, that it sounds better, and uh, it's called the Magic Kingdom. Why do so many fat people go to Disney World? <laughs> Haunches lapping over the little seats in the Grand Prix or Mr. Toad's wild ride. Does one feel weightless there? Reality displaced, so you soon begin sniffing plastic roses, and they really smell like roses, but better. 20,000 leagues under the sea, e-coupon. We stare out our portholes at fake fish on wires. The flat surface six inches above. Our kids ask, are the bubbles real? Who knows? The master's dead. Behold his haunted house at the top of Liberty Square, the orange map. As Mickey said, he had a mind like a steel mouse and the smile of reason that warmed the clean columns of Monticello fades into the flat grin of a mechanical Cheshire cat. Pink pilgrims shoulder in the squares cuddling the comic relics of infancy. In fantasy land, Mike Fink performs an unnatural act on Dumbo the unresisting. Or, or is the heat getting me? And yet, to stand in the middle of that circular movie, admission free, and see the crowd lean far to the left, feeling they're taking a curve, was, shall we say, educational. Well, you know, we loved it, and the, the guy, I don't think that was too bad a poem, or, or, or all that, and, and the, the educational thing is, you, we, this was a money-making, really a money-making affair, and it still is. I haven't been there lately, but I bet it's really expensive today, and it was expensive for us back, back then. But it's, it's fun to write, and this, these are kind of things, when you go take your kids to Disney World sometime, you might remember this poem. It might uh, help you to look at it, uh, see if Mike Fink is there. We haven't been back in a, in, in a long time. Um, I think, uh, because it's in this book, if I can find it, I'm going to uh, read a poem about, about Sports, uh, or this is about a diver. And one of the things that poetry does for us, I think, is that it, it, it makes connections, that we are, we are part of what, what doctors are saying to us. I've just read not that long ago. I've written that, written that poem a long time. Uh, what's the thing that they most get their patients complaining about, and you think shoulder injury, knees, you know, like me, I can hobble up here. Uh, it's loneliness. And that 
in America, particularly the way life has evolved in, in the years, which you know are very much on on machines and this sort of thing. And uh, when I grew up, and Jeannie grew up, we, we, she was in what I call New Jersey because I was in Brooklyn. But all our families were around, you know, the grandparents and even great parents. They all lived near near us in Flatbush. That was the way it used to be. I'm not saying it was better. It was just different. And uh, I would say we were not lonely. If people ask me to describe our house in Brooklyn, I would say noisy, but because uh, it rhymed with New Jersey in a certain in a certain way. So anyway, um, uh, this what what poetry does do is it, it connects us with with the world everything seems chaotic you read the newspaper it's it's not good news usually right down the street uh, our kids all went to lakewood high school and you saw in the paper yesterday one of the kids just before he graduates hits a tree and 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 just gets killed and this, this kind of thing by now you will have heard enough of them already and uh, it's 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 one of the things that, that that are very hard to handle and poetry is something that helps you to handle it, it doesn't it doesn't make you soppy happy or anything like that but poems say indirectly but that so that you feel it that there is a value underneath the surface that we are all connected in one way or another to each other. The very structure of it doesn't even have to talk about it. Poetry works by metaphor or simile, that is, comparison. My love is like a summer's day, or Emily Dickinson's uh, hope is the thing with feathers that perches on our soul, or you know, on the dark, T.S. Eliot say, I think we're in Rat's Alley where the dead men lose their bones. Anyway, poetry is always making connections. Whereas we're in a world where, you know, we read the stars are farther and farther away, where everything is going farther away. And po poetry is saying, you can't get too far away from me because poetry relates things. So this is, so it, like in this poem, it goes, it goes back and forth. It goes into, I mean, you don't have to know, this is the myth of, it was about a, di a diving, a friend of ours who won the uh, New Jersey Diving Championships. And so in the, uh, in the beginning, you, it's, it's talking about uh, the myth of Icarus, whose father says, do not, f if you fly out, he's, he's, they're trying to escape from an island, and, and Daedalus, who was an inventor, invents these wings, and says, you can escape. You know, I, I'm too old to escape from this. And he, he says, well, whatever, and they, the, wick, the, winds are, the wings are held together with wax, if any of you have read it, but you don't have to know it. And, and uh, so Daedalus uh, takes off with these wings that are the, held, held on with wax, and the father says, so whatever you do, don't come near the sun, this is wax, you know. And, and a little like I thought of this poem uh, basically today, I was thinking, that kid who died, Two days ago, you know, they've told him, you know, don't drive too fast, but he did. And the same as that kid, uh, Icarus, flew just what the father said, don't do. He just said, well, what, how, what's the problem here? And he, uh, his wings, his wings melted and, and he came down. And so that's sort of behind us, connecting poetry looks backwards and forwards and, and it joins things and for various other ways as as you'll see and another thing about poetry is it's the the language closest to music so you will, you will hear some rhyme in this repetition and that's what what makes it poetry and um, I made this form up myself and you'll hear the the uh, kinds of dives that he made, I repeat them because that's, I didn't know him that well, but he was older. And, but he was very nice to the young kids who wanted to swim or learn to dive and he would show us off. And, and, uh, and the story is about he went away and he went to Princeton on a scholarship and all that and I never heard from him. And then maybe 10 years later, Jeannie and I were up in Minnesota somewhere and met somebody back from our hometown and we said, you know, uh, how is, how is Bob Watson, you know, the diver? And, oh, he's died, you know, and he, he, he got married to some beautiful woman. And, and it's a typical story. This is another familiar story, almost as familiar as, uh, as Disney World, because this is a story of a really good athlete who, 
He's very young, got lots and lots of awards and promises and this sort of thing. He was, he was you know, heading for the Olympics, stuff like that. And uh, he couldn't, I, I don't know nothing, I don't know what happened except in a general sense is that he became alcoholic. You read about this on the sports pages every day. And of course, they, now they get drug tested and all that. And uh, got divorced and died young. And that's a snapshot. So I was thinking of him when he was young and was so patient uh, with us. He was kind to the children. He was generous. And so this is Elegy, Elegy for a Diver for Bob Watson. Jackknife, swan dive, gainer, twist. High off the board you'd pierce the sky and split the apple of the devil's sun and spit in the sun's fierce eye. When you were young you never missed archer, diver who flew too high, so everything later became undone. Later, Everything burned to ash, wings too close to the sun broke down, jackknife, swan dive, gainer, twist, can't be done on the ground, and nothing in your diver's past had warned you that a diver drowns when nothing replaces what is missed. Everything beautiful falls away. Jackknife, swan dive, gainer, twist. Muscles drop and skin turns coarse, even skin the sun has kissed. You drank the sun down every day until the sun no longer existed and only the drink had any force. Only the drink had any force, archer, diver, who flew too high. When you were young, you never missed and spit in the sun's fierce eye. Later, everything burned to ash, everything beautiful falls away. Even skin the sun has kissed, jackknife, swan, dave, gainer, and twist. And now, I see your bones in dreams turning and twisting below our feet, finger bones bending out like wings as once again your body sings, swan diving slowly through the stone that sparks your skull and shoulder bones. Layer by layer and over and over you flash through limestone, sand, and lava, feet together and back arched like an arrow aimed at the devil's heart. The dead are watching your perfect dive, clicking their fingers as if alive, high off the board in the hell with the chances. Once again, your body dances. Anything done well shines forever, only polished by death's dark weather. Diver, Diver, diving still, now and forever, I praise your skill. Now, in a poem like that, you know, it's not literal. You know, when I say, when a poet says forever, he, he doesn't know what forever, nobody knows that. But as much as we can do it, poetry will keep this person alive. This, in a way, it... It's trying to, to give us a, a, a sort of an, a, a ride as far as we can get to, uh, to eternity. Remember Shakespeare, if you've had to read Shakespeare and you had to read the sonnet where it uh, has that comparison. Uh, Shall I compare thee to a summer's day? But it ends, so long as men can read and eyes can see, so long lives this and this gives life to thee. So in a, in a way, I don't think Poets are soppy optimists, but they have that idea that life has meaning and, we, and, it, and it will be remembered. It will go on. So, uh, And I, I have a lot of poems about sports, but I, I don't have to, I don't have time to, to, to read it. And, uh, but there are a lot of comparisons. Probably, this is a bunch of young men out here, uh, probably most of you are interested in sports. And one of the things I found out early, because I was too, I wanted to play second base with the Dodgers. That was my natural, like all the other kids on the block. And, and um, at any rate, sports 
and poetry have a lot in common, and that is the basic thing is you need a, a certain uh, instinct you need, but you also need discipline. A, a poet cannot live just by having a, uh, inspiration. Sterling Watson and I, when we ran the workshop, we, we, we would always say, we had signs up, you know, leave inspiration behind. We didn't, you know, you can handle that on your own. What we want you to do is learn to be disciplined and practice and sit down and write your poetry if you're going to going to write a lot of it. And I, I had another thought, like, this is last night, I haven't quite formed it yet, but uh, all good poems are good and are reread by millions of people. No one reads a poem they like, you know, once. You read, you come back to that poem, and you read it over and over. And, and what, the, what they do is, why poets are aware of this, and so what, why poets are written so, poems are written so densely is there are surprises. There has to be some surprise in every poem, every good poem. Uh, and this is what catches your eye and your ear. It's the, uh, as Robert Frost said very famously, that the writer also had to, uh, had to surprise himself. You know, he, he didn't like to know what the ending was going to be. He says, because he said, no surprise in the writer, there'll be no surprise in the reader. You need to have this kind of surprise. And a good poet, you know, you've read a lot of poems by Shakespeare, a lot of poems by Richard Wilbur or something, whoever, uh, and, uh, and they often are somewhat alike, but they say something in each poem that you like that surprise you. And often when you reread it, you're surprised again. There were things in there, like if you read the, the Magic Kingdom poem I just read, a whole lot of people said to me they didn't really catch on until the reader wrote, you know, about this sacred thing and I was, I was committing a sin or something. And then they looked back to the poem and it had this kind of religious imagery and... and, and and relics and, and pilgrims. So, a good athlete, a great athlete, has to do that too. A good athlete knows how to jump, knows how to score, knows how to shoot. And uh, I watched some of the shots of the end of, of the Cleveland Cavalier game last night, you know, with LeBron James. And LeBron James is, you know, one of the great players. And everybody knows what he's, he worked and worked and, and, and became this good. And so everybody's ready for everything. And they put two men on, they put three men on, they, they don't put anyone on, they try everything. And so it's th three seconds left. And, you know, they've seen him a hundred thousand times. And he still surprised them. The ball comes to him and he, he starts charging wildly because he does that so well. And they ball him and he took two steps backward from a good distance and whoosh, game over, you know, and, and people go crazy. But it's very similar to, to poetry. You, you, a good poet is following the rules, but somewhere in there, there's something different that, that, that you haven't said. And, and, uh, and it's, it's, a, it's a wonderful thing, I think, to watch. I'll read this poem, and then one very, very short one. Okay, this is one year later. We all had Parkland in Florida. And one definition is news that stays news. And I was going to try to write something about but Parkland, but I, had, I can't do it that fast. This is a poem, a villanelle, that is about the Pulse nightclub massacre. That's, we had two of the things. And, and this is one of those kind of poems that it, it doesn't make you feel happy, but it makes you want to remember. And this is told from the point of view of the survivor, of a survivor of the Pulse Massacre, and it, I read this to the Parkland children who were reading poems on March 13th, the one-month anniversary, and this was one year later after the Pulse Massacre. Time passes, sleep ravels, a smile might start. The mind can weasel out of any trap, but there's no real healing of the heart. A sour automatic can rip apart a face or year, peeling like a thunderclap. Still time passes. Sleep ravels, smiles can start. She sang each morning. He ran our supermarket. Each memory stings sharper than a slap. How can there be a healing of the heart? Our blood slows, thickened by a poison dart. 
my bluebird, my bow, when you nestled by my lap, time passed, sleep unraveled, sly smiles might start. Now, time's tipped over like a broken cart that carries nothing forward, not a scrap, nothing much to heal in an empty heart. And what of kindness, mercy, music, art? Oh, how we all could dance, tango and tap. Time passes, sleep ravels, a smile can start, but there's no real healing for a stricken heart. And now I'm uh, right at the end, but I have one last short poem to read, and then there will be a Q&A if I haven't answered every question. This is, it might be. Um, this one is called Naked Poetry. And uh, I've always thought of poetry as a kind of confession, you know, just like the Catholic uh, confession booth. And, in, and after I had started a poem like that, it's, I stopped with it. And, and then I read some articles that had to do with surveys that, that might even be con connected to the loneliness we talked about, but that people said repression was v very bad for your health. You shouldn't repress things. And that even they could cause cancer. And you'll hear a little, little reference to the, that reminds one of cancer, but it's short. And this is my last poem afterwards, Q&A. Naked Poetry. Catholics have always known nakedness embraces sacredness. How the heart's mouth yearns to strip, if only in a box or on a page, for strangers with downcast eyes. Words reined in too long implode on liver and lung, hermit crabs, scraping the veins' lanes until they find a hole to hunker in. Look. At my hands, their ragged nails, I press them together as if to pray. Here's the church, here the steeple. Poets are unhealthy people, whether sinful or too pure. Writing is the only cure. Thank you very much for listening. And good luck. Check out a poetry book when you get a chance. I know you're busy. My question was, where do you find poetry to be the most prevalent in society, if there's any one particular place? Um, my question is, more or less, do you see it being able to reach broadly out to people, or do you find it to be often more confined, uh, let's say, like a college space? The one thing, almost every writer, not just poets, almost every writer that I know does like travel, and we have been very stimulated, Jeannie and I, my great artist over there who doesn't publish overseas, but she's been in the New Yorker, you know, a hundred times, if you were interested in drawings and, and that sort of thing. But we have lived for, with students, including Paul, right here in the front row, in London there, and we've been to Paris, we've been at, at Neuchatel for a year. And so that's inspiring for us, but I, I often find when I'm there, I write it back about back home. That's one thing. I'm sitting there that, and I see the differences and, and that comes to it. And the other thing is that I think I'm not the Lone Ranger, that most of the inspiration is at least a large part of it comes from the people around and the family most. So I have poems to uh, Jeannie and the children and our friends and uh, people, people I would have liked to meet and, and this sort of thing. And I I, uh, I used to I went to school on, with a moped and if I saw you know a birds flying in a particular way I would it's a great danger of life and all that I would pull pull over on my moped and take out my little notebook and write a, a description of it so I find it wherever I can is the answer and big things I think travel is a good question because I think poets say well you know Emily Dickinson stayed in her house and. Uh, 
I think that was wonderful that she could do that. And she couldn't even, she did it without getting her poems published. She sent them and they sent them back. But she could do it and probably I could if they locked me in the house. But I have been helped by travel and I think that would help almost everybody. Does that answer your question more or less? Yes, sir. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. Uh, good question. Because people don't know whether travel is too bothering or uh, to, to do. And yeah. Harold. You mentioned that uh, that you and Sterling Watson, if I heard you correctly, yeah. told your students to leave their inspiration at home. Yes. But uh, they had to learn the discipline of, of writing creatively. Yes. Uh, in your experience, uh, how much editing uh, discipline uh, did you find that you needed in your poetry? Yes, uh, that's a good question. Just kind of flow. Well, this is a, a this is a battle, but I mean the true answer is I one I use a lot of discipline and rewriting. It's like everybody has had the experience. You said something pretty good, and you go upstairs uh, for the night, and you think. I, I meant to add this, I meant to do this, I could have said it better, we have that, that's, and that's true with writing. Now, as with life, you could be playing poker, and you could get dealt four aces, but this is not a way to plan to be a poker player, you know, you've got to know more about it than to wait for your four aces, you know, this is a thing, and, and I, have, I have had a few poems where, you know, I took a deep breath and, and and I and I wrote the whole thing, and but I I'm not sure I, I uh, you know I must have gone back and fixed it up a little bit, but very frequently with poems, uh, you get an uh, you get that inspiration and that does come and you write that down and what you want to do is get that to go somewhere to make it interesting to somebody else to make sense of it to make it fit in a larger you know all kinds of reasons, and for that. I recommend, you know, students uh, studying. They should, studying is not quite the right word because I never took a writing workshop in my life. They didn't have them back, uh, back in the 40s, 50s, 60s, then when I was starting. And, but uh, my first advice to anybody who's really interested in, in writing poetry is what I say to all, all of you who are not. I say, you've got to read a lot of poetry. If you were, so that then when you're, you get an inspiration and the sun is setting and all of a sudden the roseate spoonbill goes right over the royal palm, you know, something that catches you. And if you know how to write a sonnet, you might, you'll be able to recognize this would make a perfect sonnet. Or if, if something is happening on the beach, well, this may, maybe should be a longer poem. And you, like a conductor of an orchestra, he, he doesn't exactly have to, have to play the French horn, but he should know, be able to recognize it. You know, he, sh he should know what, what he can use. And so I do a lot of rewriting. Uh, I once read quite a while back with John Charty, who was a very well-known poet. He was down here at Eckerd and all that. And, and this was the time when the Beatniks were coming up. You know, of course, we were all sympathetic, sympathetic with the Beatniks, who they wrote very freely, and they said they, I mean, basically, they didn't do much rewriting. It turns usually out not to be totally true at all. But so, uh, Charty read something of, of sonnet or something, and. and uh, of young man, so old, you know, bearded and everything. He says, "Well, what about spontaneity? Isn't poetry about finding your spontane spontaneity, your spontaneous emotions? Isn't that what you want?" And Charlie thought for a second. He says, "Son, my poems don't get spontaneous till the fourteenth draft." And there's a lot of true truth in that because you write things and and it doesn't. They sound a little stiff. They don't. They're a little crooked. And what you're what I'm trying to do, and I think most poets, I'm trying to write so that these poems I just read to you, I hope they sounded as, I just rolled them off. They sounded pretty grammatical and straight. There's nothing to keep you away from listening to the story. There's, there's rhythm in it and all that, but I try to move that, and that wasn't the way I did it first, to, uh, into something that would be, why should you write it? We read it, I mean, why should anybody write this thing? And, and uh, to me, that, 98% of the time, that means quite a bit of rewriting. Students don't like that, usually, to start with, but then I get letters later on. I say, I've just published this, my first poem, and you know, and I, it was my 100th draft or something like that. That's a good way, yeah. Donald Hall, a very good poet, uh, 
who I guess was a, a Pulitzer Prize winner at one time. At, uh, Keep, he's one of the few poets, and he, he hasn't switched to the uh, computer particularly. He has a typewriter, and he saves. He has a, he lives in his grandmother's house up in, I think, Vermont, New Hampshire, maybe. And uh, he has these big uh, cabinets, metal cabinets, where he has all the drafts, and they are. He says, maybe I average like 40 per, you know, and he goes up into the hundreds and he saves every copy, every page that he types out. And you think, well, how does he have time? But he just writes every day, you know, it just so, it, uh, even though his books are slim, uh, he has written a lot of pages. <laughs> Another poet, William Stafford, uh, who wrote every morning, this was the way to do it, more than anybody that I knew, and he got up, you know, like at five, really early in the morning, and he wrote, and he published a lot of poetry, and he was a wonderful writer. And someone said a little bit, uh, like, like Harold said, well, well, so, you write every morning. He said, yeah, I do. I just, now it's just the way I live and, and it's the way I breathe. And he says, well, what if you, what if you can't think of anything? And uh, uh, Bill said, uh, hmm, well, I lower my standards, he said. <laughs> so he, you know, he looks out the window, oh, there's a squirrel there, he's shaking his tail at something. Oh, maybe it's that uh, mockingbird over there, I don't know. And then, then you know, he, he waits until something gets interesting to him and he proceeds to... Uh... And then, you know, after you've done a bit of writing, you have, you have a backup of things. I always have something that I haven't finished, you know, so I, I go back to other things. And also, I do write stories too, so... Uh, yes. First of all, sir, thank you so much for being here. Really appreciate it. We had a question as a class. Um, where do you believe the future of poetry lies within the current generation? Well, uh, one, it's going to change to uh, to a certain way. Uh, we just, uh, but, but we just uh, read, uh, listened at the Dali. Patricia Smith came. And she was really, really good. And Patricia Smith was famous about eight or ten years ago, and I heard her in Asheville. And she was a slam poet. She would get up there, and it was all uh, memorized, but it wasn't always the same. She would change it, you know. And, and, and she thinks that in some ways, and I think that's right, there's going to be more emphasis on that kind of uh, oral poetry. And what has happened to Patricia Smith, I don't know if this is a way that things are going, that now she's, since she became famous as a oral poet, not written out, uh, she went back and studied a lot more and is, now has published, you know, some very good books of sort of regular, regular poems. And what remains with her is she's a knockout reader of these regular poems. She's really good. So I think it's, it's going to be more stuff that'll be published. It's going to be easier to get published. So uh, online, and, and I'm an old fuddy dud, and uh, uh, my worry on that is, uh, I think online is good. I, I'm all for it. I read some, but I don't think you get as much. You, you don't memorize as you don't re stick with as much when you're hearing it, and as when it's in a book. And also, if you publish a book online, I think good for you, but there's no quality control. So. And it all depends on who's, uh, who's judging it or something like that. But I think you're safer if you're, if you're interested in being a writer. I would n not hesitate, I think, to uh, publish online, but I would aim at getting where, where my books are in, the, in your library. And that, that's what I think of myself, and I, I love the feel of books. You know, this is nice. <laughs> and, but anyway, I think uh, that's, that's certainly a coming thing, that there'll be more oral poetry, and that, that, there's no reason why that can't be, and I know it, I've heard a lot of wonderful stuff. And I've gone in, into slams, you know, and it's been kind of interesting. The people are, you know, leaping around the stage and, and throwing things, and people are ducking, and I'm reading my little sonnet, you know, like this, and, uh, and it's a very nice change. But, the, you know, the house of poetry is big, that's my idea. Lots of rooms. So bring it on, I say, and we'll, we'll, I don't know what forever means, but we'll see which lasts, and <laughs> I'm going with that. Good question. So who are some of your favorite poets, and how do they inspire you? Um, the uh, older poets that, uh, when I, 
that inspired me. Um, I had written, as, as I told you, I, I didn't, I was a closet poet. I was in the closet. And the, though they were hints of, of it, though they, they didn't know whether it was poetry particularly. My high school yearbook, they had at the end, you know, what, uh, what you wanted to be and what you might be written by the editor or something. And it said, Peter Meinke wants to be writer probably will be censored. So that was how I, I kind of kept it quiet. Uh, but at school at Hamilton College, there was a poet, a, a writer, a, a college professor, and he was brilliant, and he loved poetry, had it memorized. And so I took up my nerve, and I put some poems in with some test he gave, and he sent it back to me, wisely not saying a word about my poems. He said, young man, go to the bookstore and uh, get the selected poems of John Dunn. It only cost 50 cents. And what was great about that is how he would know. I mean, he could have said anybody else, but John Dunn was exactly the kind of poet that I wanted. He was, you know, 18th, uh, 17th century poet who liked formal stuff. He was, he, he, uh, he rhymed, he liked, he was interested in religion. He was a great love poet. He was very sexy. That was appealing, very funny along, along those lines. And, and, then, and he was smart. He had, he was a, a brilliant poet. And he be, became a great, a great a minister in the, uh, in the cathedral in, in St. Paul's in, in London. And so I wrote a lot like that, and it was enormously helpful to me. I, I studied his poem, and I came on the story that I, oh, I still see some of my college friends, and, and they remember I came home, I had two, two college roommates, and I have my little 50 cent book, you know, and I said, listen to this. And I, I read the whole book that night, you know, they, of course, falling asleep and said, ah, oh, come on, he finished yet? And it, 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 I think it changed my life. Then I liked poets like Howard Nemiroff and uh, Robert Frost, Emily Dickinson. Um, today, some poets, you know, including ones in Florida, like Campbell, Campbell McGrath, who won the, won the Genius Award, the MacArthur thing, you know, and he's, he's a very good poet, and, and I like his poems. And uh, we, Jeannie and I met Maxine Kuhlman, who's another poet I admired a great deal. And, uh, and maybe the most on my, uh, influenced me was a poet named William Meredith, who just died a little while ago. And what I liked about Meredith is he had a point of view that you look around, and you see all these terrible things happen, the, these massacres that are happening, the, the disagreements, the embarrassments that, the, that are happening. And then he writes about these things, all these terrible things that happen in Africa, Ireland, doesn't matter where. Uh, and he says, in, he says, in two thirds of the world, or one third, you know, that a normal American house to millions and millions of people is like a palace to one third of the world, whatever that is. And so he said, uh, to start with, as a writer, feel fortunate as an American writer. So I use that as a title of one of my books, to start with, feel fortunate, because I think that's, that's what the, an attitude I think is a good one to have. Don't be blind as to what's happening, but feel lucky to be here where we are in this room listening to poetry, after all. And uh, that may not be the luckiest thing in your life, but uh, it's, we are lucky, yes. Um, I heard you speak about poetry slams, and I was wondering how closely related do you think music is to improvisation poetry? I think it must be a help, you know, since I don't do improv, but uh, it's, you know, it's hard to say what poetry is, but it's a special language. I'll see if I can remember a poem by Howard Nemiroff, very short. It says, because you asked for the difference between poetry and prose, he says, sparrows were feeding in a freezing drizzle that as we watched turned into pieces, pieces of snow, riding a gradient invisible from silver aslant to random white and slow. There came a moment when you couldn't tell. And then they clearly changed, they cl and then they clearly flew instead of fell. What I'm saying is that po you recognize poetry, and there's no real definition, but all of a sudden you're reading something, or, and you're listening to something, and you feel that rise. And this, he's talking about a, the rain when it turns to a snowflake, and, and it's a very good image. So uh, I, I, 
I think jazz is a very good way to, uh, we, we like jazz too, and I think it does affect some rhythms. And we like, of course, classical music. My mother was a pianist, and Jeannie's mother played the piano on the radio. So we have two pianists in our family that uh, neither Jeannie and I do. <laughs> I play a little bit, but not much. But does that answer your question? Yes, sir, it does. Thank you very much. Thank you so yeah. much. Okay. so much. Dr. Mankey has generously agreed to stay. If anybody would like to talk to him or get something signed, he's also got some books that you may purchase if you want to explore his poetry, his poetry further. And um, please feel free and comfortable to do that. And thank you so much for visiting us today, Dr. Mankey.